Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Well, welcome back to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. Today, my guest is Rob Nyer. Rob is the commissioner for the West Coast League, as well as a well What's the word I want to use? Well known, I guess known, Rob. Uh, in is, some circles, is, yes. In some circles, you are very well known as a, as a baseball author and with an interesting story. So welcome. Thank you. And let's, well, first off, I I, I, I want you to introduce yourself, but I'm just going to ask one question first. You're not really a Kansas City Royals fan, are you? Well, I would <laughs> say there is a part of me buried fairly deep now that that remains a Royals fan that's that's I became an obsessive baseball fan almost purely because of the Kansas City Royals when I was a a kid and so that's that's still deep inside me but but it sort of that part of me sort of most of that sort of fell away as I after when I moved away from Kansas City and then they spent years just basically operating exactly the opposite of how I wanted them to operate. And so it was actually better for my mental health at one point to just <laughs> stop caring so much. And I, I did. It, it was a process, but it, it happened. And then a few years later, they won the World Series. So yeah. it didn't work out so well for me. Who uh, Who is your favorite Kansas City Royal of all time? What what player resonates with you? Like, <sighs> It's a tough one. I, I, my favorites tended to be whoever was having the best season at the time when I was a kid. And so that was often George Brett. But later, I probably wound up settling on a player named Frank White, who was the Royals' second baseman for 12, no, it was more than that. It was more like 15 years, won a number of gold gloves. And I always liked him, but he wound up, after his career working in proximity with my mother at her job uh, at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Kansas City. And she actually spent enough time around him that she was able to become friendly with him and set up a lunch for the three of us together. And so I got to spend an hour just talking to Frank about, about baseball and which was sort of like my dream date. And I think he's (laughs) been my favorite ever since that was 20 some years ago. Okay. That's all right. See, that's, I love those stories that people have, you know, cause it's easy to say, you know, George Brett, or if you're a Mariners right. fan, you know, Griffey or, right. I mean, there's, you know, so you grew up in Kansas city, right. In, in that mm-hmm. general area. I did. I read that you went to university of Kansas. Yep. So I'm going to guess that tonight you're rooting for North Carolina. <laughs> Uh, no, I became a Kansas <laughs> basketball fan the minute I stepped on campus, actually the, the probably the spring before, uh, I, okay. I had grown up a Missouri fan because I was born in Columbia, Missouri, which is where the U- university of Missouri is. And I always thought I might go, just go to school there one day. And I wound up settling on Kansas instead because all my friends were going there and, and it was uh, cheaper and <laughs> immediately became a Kansas basketball fan. That was a long time ago. That was almost 40 years ago. And yeah. I still am semi obsessed with Jayhawks basketball. In fact, I, I somebody asked me this morning on another podcast uh, to answer a question about the 2022 baseball season, and I had to respond honestly. I, I haven't even thought about it yet because my I have I've had this routine for a long time. I don't even pay attention to baseball at all outside of Twitter. I don't pay attention to it until the Jayhawks are knocked out of the the tournament and they don't typically make the final four or the final. So sometime in mid to late March, um, I completely um, stop paying attention to basketball and I immerse myself in baseball. Well, guess what? It hasn't happened yet. It won't <laughs> happen until probably either tonight um, after the game or during the game if they're getting blown out or tomorrow morning. Okay. So you're, you're already behind for baseball season. I am well behind. I'm actually quite fortunate that the season is ending late because it was supposed to have started by now. That's I'm true. Sorry, That's true. Start, yeah, starting yeah. late. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I'm, uh, I would really be behind and I would feel even more embarrassed than I do, but I'm <laughs> fortunate that that opening day is actually what four days this season after the, uh, the, the 
the final in, in basketball. Well, how, all right, you said something earlier in, in, in your backstory. So what, what was it do you think got you so deeply connected to baseball? Why, why baseball and not basketball or football or, you know, soccer or any other sport? It was, and this has actually been, been studied uh, with some degree of precision scientifically. There is a sweet spot for, I guess, probably sports fans generally, but certainly baseball fans. That's what the study was, what was was about. There is a sweet spot between the ages of nine or 10 and 13 when you are particularly prone or susceptible to becoming an obsessive baseball fan. <laughs> if you are that age and your team is highly successful, like you can really get locked in. You're more likely to get locked in. And that's what happened. We moved to Kansas City, the Kansas City area, when I was just about to turn 10. And I had, at that point, I was a sports fan. I loved all sports. I played everything, everything that, was, that, I, that you could play. I played. Uh, not that I was any good, but I played. I was crazy for playing sports. And I also enjoyed watching sports and following sports. I read Sports Illustrated and uh, the sporting news when it was around. Whatever it was, whatever was there, I would read. But I wasn't a crazy baseball fan until we moved to Kansas City. This was, I hate to date myself, but this was 1976. And we moved... To, we moved there in literally in April, as I recall. So the baseball season had just started, and Kansas City at that point was baseball mad. You everywhere you went, the Royals game was on the radio. Everywhere you went, the Roy, people were talking about the Royals. They had nearly beat out the A's for the division title the year before. F- fell short in September, and then in '76. It all came together, not that we knew that and anybody knew that in April because you don't know what's going to happen in your season in April, but but there was just this amazing amount of excitement. So we just sort of arrived, and that was already in the air, and then the Royals were so good. They had so many great players, George Brett most notably, but it was just incredibly easy to fall in love with this team, and, and then they wound up winning in 1976 and 77 and 78, the division titles, losing to the Yankees in the playoffs every year, but... Um, I almost immediately became obsessed. You know, had to read the newspaper the next morning to read the see the box score, the whole thing. So that's sort of where it started. I'm sure, you know, I wasn't alone. There were a lot of kids in Kansas City in the late 70s became rabid fans because that team was was so interesting and so successful. That's interesting. So you moved to a major league city. I, I grew up in Tacoma, and that was after the Pilots but before the Mariners. So mm-hmm. I I followed, so there was three teams that I followed, and it was the the San Francisco Giants, the Oakland A's, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. And I obsessively read the Tacoma News Tribune's box scores, and my parents had a friend who had a subscription to the to Sports Illustrated. You mentioning this, I hadn't thought about this in years. And I would go, my parents would go visit them, and he would always here you go. Give them to basically it was to get the kid to shut up for a while because my parents were bringing me along and they they'd give me you know Sports Illustrated and so I would devour you know the late sixties to mid seventies um, Sports Illustrated magazines and uh, that's when it, that's what that's when it you know I got bit without even a team locally you know and then so uh, the I, I get the A's and the Giants because as I as I have heard. Mm-hmm. Those teams actually broadcast their games up into the Pacific Northwest. Right. But why the Pirates? Probably because of Sports Illustrated and Roberto Clemente. Clemente was there was something about Roberto Clemente as a player that really, and in his tragic his tragic death, that really you know, and then Willie Stargell and Manny Sanguian. The the Pirates were a fun team to watch back then, right? And um, you know, I would watch, and it's funny you say this because this is bringing up stuff. You know, there was this uh, appliance store. That my parents would go to regularly. I don't know why, but on Saturdays I'd go watch, you know, Saturday baseball with Joe Garagiola at the, they'd put me in front of a TV and I'd watch that while they were out shopping or something, you know? <laughs> and so that was kind of, you know, blame it on Joe Garagiola. Um, but that was kind of how I got enamored in my, my grandfather was a huge uh, Tacoma giants fan. So we'd go to the Tacoma giants games, which, you know, there was amazing ballplayers that came through Tacoma through the sixties right. and seventies. 
That's just, that's when it's, so it's funny you said, cause I never heard that study, but yeah, 10 to 13. Yeah. That's when it hit me too. Okay. It's, it's when you're old enough to know what's happening and read the box scores and, and figure statistics if you enjoy that sort of thing. But before you discover how important girls are, basically. Right. Right. I mean, for, for, for me, anyway, realize- I think it, it all yeah. just resonated because at some point now I never lost that. I was still obsessed with the Royals well into my twenties, but because it was, it had already sunk in. I think if I had come to the Royals when I was 14 or 15, I was like, okay, that's interesting. There's a baseball team there, but there's also this other thing that I'm obsessed about. And I really don't have room for two things. Right. Right. Now I get that. So, <laughs> so you went to university of Kansas and then after school, you ended up working for Bill James. I, I did it. it uh, w- look, whenever, whenever there always seems to be this sort of, notion that people who people who are successful or who achieve some level of success in their in their field uh, I don't have any patience with with those people who don't give a some degree of credit to just a lot of good luck mm-hmm. and I certainly now granted I'm probably even exceptional in that regard but I had so much good luck early in my life. Um, the only reason I worked, wound up working for Bill, and by the way, this was, as I've said many times, if you had asked me when I was 19, 20, 21, Rob, you, if you could do anything, if you could have any job, what would it be? Literally, my answer would have been work for Bill James. Wow, okay. Now, I had no idea how that could actually happen. I, I didn't consider it a realistic option for me it was like it was the same as uh saying what would you do if you won the lottery well i didn't <laughs> i never played the lottery so it's a, it's a silly thing to even consider i also didn't have any any notion on how one would would work for bill james or or someone like bill james but i just sort of fell into it largely because well for a couple of reasons one bill happened to live about an hour away from from where I lived in Lawrence, Kansas. And for another, Bill and I wound up having a mutual friend. Um, I, I, one of Bill's good friends was a man named Mike Cope, who I'm, we're still, you know, I'm still friends with Mike today. Uh, Mike ran a little, on the weekends, a little bookshop in a flea market in Lawrence. And I just became friendly with Mike. And when after I had left school, dropped out of school basically, and was roofing houses, Bill was looking for a research assistant. And Mike, over my protestations, Mike convinced me to apply for that job. And for some reason, Bill hired this college dropout who didn't have a transcript because it was too embarrassing to to, to show anyone. <laughs> I'm uh, not laughing at you. I'm just thinking of the parallels. That's all. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. So yeah, it, it, I was not qualified for the job. Um, I have no no idea why Bill hired me, other than that um, I wouldn't have to relocate from somewhere far away. Uh, but I spent four years with Bill, and obviously learned a ton. And Bill gave me some tremendous opportunities, not only to do research for his books, but also to actually write in 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 them. And um, everything that's happened to me since then, all the great things that have happened since then, professionally, are are due to Bill. What did you, what were you majoring in in college? I never declared. I mean, I was the worst college student in history. I, I was, if you've ever seen Animal House, I was not that far off um, uh, John Belushi's character, except that I didn't drink nearly as much as, as, as he does. Uh, but um, I really didn't, I just didn't, I, I, I was, I really didn't have any conception of what would lay beyond college so I didn't wasn't motivated to study really very often or choose a major or think about a career any of those things I just really didn't belong in honestly didn't belong there it's a, sort of a it was a semi miracle that I lasted for the four years that I did my uh, my bio on our website says I went to Central Washington University and my freshman year was the best six years of my life <laughs> so I mean I'm I the parallels are real here that's just 
funny. I, okay. I think I might have wound up with enough credits after four years to maybe be halfway through my junior year. Yeah, I, I'm not I sure. I've never too, gone but, back and yeah. looked, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's pretty ugly. Well, what? Okay. If you look, if I made you decide today, what what do you think you would have majored in back then? What was? I definitely, what would you? Have, so the the subjects that I studied the most and considered were um, political science and 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 history i, I enjoyed okay. those classes and took most of my classes that that i uh i, mean, I took things for fun too like you know, japanese cinema or and uh the literature of baseball things like that but okay but in terms of uh, consistently going oh yeah i should take this this semester it was history and it was political science okay so then after uh, your four years with, with Bill James, you ended up at, um, well, not ESPN per se, correct? But ESPN, something else that was, was this predating it or? That's right. Well, first there was a stint trying to, 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 to make a living as a freelance writer. And, and that was a disaster after the first good job. Um, I, I found a bunch of ill-paying jobs that that didn't allow me to to feed myself basically and just not the right place for me to be out there hustling work um then i fortunately and again i'm sure with some help from bill um i got a job at a company called stats inc which is still around in a much different form uh but i was at stats inc for almost two and a half years and then i then came out to the pacific northwest to work for Mm -hmm. what was i don't think this company still exists i could be wrong but there was a company called starwave owned by paul allen and it was right this was in the very early days of cd roms and the internet all those things and it was a multimedia company that not only built websites but also cd rom games and various other things i'm probably forgetting uh, and one of the websites that that starwave built this paul allen company built was called ESPN Net Sports Zone, which some people might still remember. For some reason, it couldn't just be ESPN.com. I don't remember why, but it, it had to have this bizarre, na- uh, unmemorable name. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what brought me out to the to the Northwest, uh, working as the, then theoretically an editor at ESPN Net Sports Zone. Okay, and you stayed out in the Northwest since. I have. Uh, it, it's funny. Uh, the first winter was tough. I missed the Midwest, felt hemmed in by the mountains and and oppressed by the lack of sunlight. But <laughs> after about a year, or maybe it was two, I, I I might be romanticizing that period, but it might have been two years. But then I realized, oh, I don't ever want to go back. Uh, uh, not that I don't enjoy uh, the the everything back, what I was still sort of home, the Midwest, Kansas, Missouri, that whole space but um i I have come to it didn't take long for me to 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 feel like the northwest was really where i belonged okay and then after your your time there you did that transition into espn it did yeah there was there was a it was weird there was it was such a strange time on in, in in that world starwave was bought by a company called infoseek which was a search engine Searching, yeah, basically, <laughs> right. And was. there, there was this period which everybody still, everybody still aware of Yahoo. But there was this period when all these different companies were fighting to have the search engine, right? Before mm-hmm. Google took over, and there was Google, there was Yahoo, there was InfoSeek, and I think there were a few others. Um, Alta Vista. There you go. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I believe it was InfoSeek that that bought us no was it infoseek i can't even remember now there was also this thing called go.com which either was a different company or part of infoseek but we were go.com in fact if you go and look at i think go.com still pops up in some of the espn.com urls it's a weird little vestige of this thing that happened 25 (laughs) years ago Um, but yeah we got bought out first by this other company and then ultimately disney bought that company and I became a Disney employee, an actual Disney employee, and we became ESPN.com instead of this other weird sports zone uh, thing. And I was I was at one of the other one of the other places for almost exactly fifteen years. Wow. Okay. 
and then now you're back out as an independent author, right? Freelance, right? No, no. After stops okay. along the way at a few other, a couple of other places, I am okay. Um, and you know, I am writing books when I can. Um, I've written a couple of books since my last full time writing gig. There's a new one out just this spring, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, and, um, we'll take the occasional freelance job, although it's been a while. Um, mostly because I have had a tougher time finding the time, uh, not to write, but just the time to track down a story that I think is worth spending a month working on. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course there's the commissioner gig, which is also, it feels like a, a, a really easy part-time job for eight, nine months out of the year. And that feels like a crazy full-time plus job during the season. So since this is about the West Coast League, and thank you for this setup, how did you end up, did you approach the league to be commissioner? Did the league approach you? Did you? It, being the commissioner of a baseball league would have been just about as impossible in my mind as working for Bill James was when I was <laughs> 22. Um, and again, I'll go back to what I said about being lucky i have found and i wouldn't recommend this to people i don't think it's actually the smart way to go about your your life or certainly your professional life just waiting for things to happen but i have found for me personally when i've gone after things it hasn't really worked out so well and almost almost all of the things that the good things have have just sort of come to me uh for whatever reasons that 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 applies to the best jobs that I've had. It applies to the most interesting books that I've that I've worked on, uh, and it certainly applies. It certainly describes the the job as commissioner. Uh, I was um, asked five years ago, more like four years ago actually, to to give a talk at a a banquet, a baseball banquet here in Portland. And I had earlier written a talk for another, another thing. And I thought this, I could just give this one again, punch it up a little bit for this audience. And so I did that. I punched it up, but I had a little more work to do uh, before it was ready. The, the, the day of the banquet. And I think this is, I'm a big believer in the, the tyranny of the subconscious I really don't enjoy giving those sorts of doing those sorts of things because I'm still one of those people who's probably on on some level that 14 year old who's afraid of public speaking. Although I've done a fair amount of it over the years, and obviously I've done a gazillion podcasts and radio shows and whatnot. But standing up on that dais with all these people looking up at me, it's it's still somewhat terrifying. Uh, and I think my subconscious said, "Nope, we're not doing this." So the day of the banquet, I was, and I had known, like I, I thought consciously earlier that week, Rob, you got to take a half an hour and punch up that talk. Okay, I'll do it. The day of the banquet, I was sitting in a coffee shop here in, near my house in North Portland, working on something completely different. And I got a text from a friend of mine, Rob Nelson who is somewhat famous as the inventor of big league chew shredded bubble gum. And Rob was going to the banquet that night and the tech said, Hey, do you want to, you want to ride to the, the thing tonight? I literally had not thought about this the entire day. My subconscious <laughs> had decided we're not going to go and we're just going to forget about the whole, that this is happening. This thing has been on your calendar for three months. Um, so, and this was about four o'clock in the afternoon that, Four four thirty in the afternoon. The the thing's scheduled for seven. <laughs> well, I was mortified. Obviously, I did take a half an hour and punched up the talk and printed it out and got got there on time and found something to wear. But anyway, the, my point is that uh, that I was if Rob hadn't texted me, I would not have been there that evening. I would not have given this talk. Dan Siegel, who runs the Corvallis Knights in the West Coast League would not have been would not have seen me give this talk and would not have thought hey 
Rob seems reasonably self-assured up there. He's a baseball <laughs> guy, and we need somebody this summer who can sort of serve as the public face of the league and also mediate any disputes that we have or 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 hand down any discipline if a coach gets a jet, whatever it is, right? The, the right. sort of the basic job description. So it, it, it's I'm only talking to you right now because my friend Rob Nelson texted me to check if I wanted to ride to this banquet that night. Uh, so there's just so much of that in my, there's always been so much of that in my life, just little bits of good luck like that. I don't know what was in Dan's head when he thought that I might be able to do this, but he did think I might be able to do it. We met for breakfast not long afterward. And uh, when he said, hey, do you think you would in, w- would be interested? I said, sure. See, I didn't have anything lined up. I just finished a new book or was about to finish my my a new book and had literally nothing happening that summer and i just thought it'd be an interesting summer job essentially i'd never you know how many people get a chance to do this so i said sure the he was able to convince his fellow board members the other owners in the league that that i could be a good fit and uh we had a couple of long uh, phone conversations where i got to meet everybody and um and that's just sort of how it started wow (laughs) I'm laughing because you, you, you know, you're saying that you don't, things that you pursue don't go well, things that just kind of serendipitously present themselves. I saw a Facebook blurb about the Wenatchee Applesauce looking for a PA guy. And I said, oh, that'd Uh be fun. Mm -hmm. Never in my, never in my wildest dreams when I thought about doing something like that. And so here I go this summer sitting there and being the PA guy. That'll be interesting. All right. Well, I hope I don't have to suspend you for criticizing the umpires. Well, I they well not not to talk bad about Wenatchee, Win- but they already told me I have to criticize the umpires. Am I you know, am I getting bad information here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to suspend whoever told you that. Okay, yeah, all right. Well, I won't. No, so you're off the hook. Yeah, thanks. So, so you take the job as the commissioner of this league. How many teams mm-hmm. were in the league at that time? That's a good question. Uh, I believe that first season we probably had twelve. Okay. Uh, it's the problem. The reason I have trouble remembering is that we've jumped back and forth in numbers of teams because of expansion and COVID. So it's been mm-hmm. uh, uh, the numbers get mixed up in my head. But I believe we had twelve that first season. It was either. I also feel like we had an odd number one season, um, but that might have been before I came around. Okay. Well, actually, before we talk about your your tenure so far, let's go back. Give the audience. The backstory of the West Coast League. How did it come about? What's its market? What's its intention? So I am not exceptionally well versed in the history. I know that the that the league, the roots go back roughly twenty years now to maybe even before that. I mean, the the team I mentioned, the Corvallis Knights earlier, the team Dan Siegel runs, where they. Before the league existed, they were the Aloha Knights, based in the Portland area, and they weren't exactly a collegiate summer team. They were really sort of what used to be called the semi-pro or sandlot team. They would just basically play anyone. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's this. I'm sure you're aware, Scott, that there used to every small town in America used to have a baseball team. Absolutely, uh, they called it town ball, mm-hmm. and. There is a perception now, I think, among many baseball fans, if not most, probably most, that that world has sort of doesn't exist anymore, which is true. Every town doesn't still have a team, but there are still baseball teams all over the place. Uh, Adult leagues, uh, summer leagues for high school kids, for college kids of all different skill levels. And the Aloha Knights were a part of that world. They wouldn't draw fans unless it was a few family members. I don't even, I doubt if they were charging admission to their games. But they had some pretty good players. Uh, and some of whom, I mean, one of, at least one of whom, no, it must be more than one, wound up in the major leagues. Uh, so there, there was a, the talent level was good. There really wasn't a lot of super organized collegiate summer baseball. Then, for those, for anyone listening who doesn't know about collegiate summer baseball, uh, the most famous league is the Cape Cod League. It's been around forever. The Alaska Baseball League is another league that's been around forever. 
lot of famous players up in Alaska and in the Cape. Uh, that world has exploded over the last 15 or 20 years. Now, if you are, if you are a collegiate, a college player with any professional aspirations at all, it's just sort of assumed that you'll go play somewhere in the summer. Mm-hmm. And these leagues are all over the country. You can't find a, um, you, you can't go very far without running into a collegiate summer league or team. They're all over California. There are two good sized leagues in the Northwest. There's our league and there's the uh, Cascade Collegiate League. Uh, just there's league everywhere you can think of. There are there are these collegiate summer leagues, and there was a league. I want to say it was called the Pacific International League, and I might be wrong about this. Twenty some years ago, and there were a couple of teams that the Knights were in that league. I believe the Kelowna Falcons, Kelowna being in British Columbia, I believe they were in the league. I believe it was those two teams that basically said, we're going to leave this other league, the PIL, and we're going to create this new league, which, by the way, had a different name. I think they were the West Coast Collegiate Baseball League, the WCCBL at the beginning, and then quickly, within a year or two, changed their name to the West Coast League. Um, So that's the roots. We've been the West Coast League, or the West Coast League has existed since since 2005. Mm -hmm. Um, So getting up close to our 20 year anniversary. I believe that's roughly the history, but honestly I have to go to Wikipedia and check every once in a while because um, I wasn't around until the last four years. Okay. You have a breakfast meeting. You have some phone conversations. Mm -hmm. You agree to take this. We'll call it a part-time job for Mm -hmm. summer. You know, (laughs) was it what you expected? No, it was not. There's nothing that can prepare you for for being the commissioner, or in most leagues, it would be you, you, it's the president. We call it the commissioner in, in our league. Nothing can prepare you for it unless you have been in that world, and not the world of baseball, but in the world of a league being a, a because there are things that happen in a league that most of the teams that don't have any idea about that they stay just within this team and this team or this. So, no, there was nothing that could prepare me for it. In retrospect, I think that I would have been well served to have at least gone back and reread or read for the first time as many books as I could find about baseball commissioners because there are a bunch of them out there. Um, uh, you know, most of the MLB commissioners over the years have written a book. Some of the league presidents, American National League presidents, wrote books. Uh, when I when I go back now and look at those books, I say, "Oh yeah, that that happens even in my league." <laughs> What's it, it? What what I didn't realize or didn't really understand, even if I might have uh, have have acknowledged it, what I didn't wasn't able to really understand or conceptualize was just how much of a this job is about managing relationships and that comes up again and again when you read the books by baseball commissioners and i i think someone might fairly listen to me talking and 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 think rob really shouldn't be comparing his job to rob manfred's job or Bowie coon's job or wh- whomever because it's not the same thing and of course it's not the same thing they're worlds apart for for one thing uh, an mlb commissioner is managing a staff of many dozens, maybe now it's hundreds. That job has gotten so much bigger. The business of baseball has gotten so much bigger. But the the one thing that, that I think is common, whether it's the West Coast League or, shoot, uh, a Little League or Major League Baseball, is that you're essentially managing this group. Managing isn't the right word. You're, you're working with this disparate group of people it's not a monolithic group we've got now 16 teams in the west coast league and when i think about the the groups who run or own these teams everyone's everybody's different uh it's it's the opposite of one size you know we've got we've got 
two of our teams are owned by the same person who basically who owns the Seattle Mariners. We have at least two, and I might be forgetting one, billionaires in our league. We also have ownership groups where this is what they're doing for a living, basically. Uh, this is their their business. Mm-hmm. Uh, they We have teams in huge markets, Victoria, Edmonton, Portland. We have teams in Walla Walla and Wenatchee and Port Angeles. Mm-hmm. So... In in one way, we're more our, our league is more is more diverse than by far than Major League Baseball, where at least every market is you know among the top thirty or forty markets in in North America. So we're we are all over the map, both literally and figuratively, and that's the interesting thing for me is how do all these people work together? How do they best work together? Now, I'm I'm certainly no expert when it comes to to managing relationships and it's been a it's been a learning process no question from day one and i i am fortunate that the the people in the league have been patient with me as i've learned how to 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 figure all this stuff out well you mentioned you know edmonton portland victoria those those are probably the three largest markets right it's hard for me to think of victoria as being a large market but it's it's a bigger bigger place than you i initially thought And Edmonton's new to the league this year, correct? That's right. Yeah, we have okay. four teams entering their first seasons. And so who are those four? Since they're not in Washington, so I didn't talk about them on the other episodes. <laughs> well, three of them are in Canada. Edmonton, Kamloops, British Columbia, and Nanaimo, British Columbia. Uh, okay. I have not been to Edmonton yet. I will be there in June. I have not been to Kamloops. will be there in June. I have been to Nanaimo. I was there when they made their big announcement which was actually two years ago they were supposed to be in the league last season but because of covid they weren't able to play but nanaimo is for anyone who doesn't know it's a it's a wonderful old fishing town on the east coast of victoria island um is wait is it vancouver island I Van- the it's vancouver it's island vancouver island Van- vancouver island. right yeah. vancouver the city is not on Vancouver no. Island, which is confusing, at least. And Victoria me. is, so you. Victoria yeah. no, is. Victoria is actually the capital of British Columbia, as you know. Uh, and Nanaimo is about, <laughs> uh, I think it's about 90, uh, 90 minutes, maybe 60, 70 miles north of Victoria on the, on the again, the east coast of Vancouver Island. And it's just, uh, it's just a delightful place. And then where's the fourth, the fourth new team? Oh, Springfield, Oregon. Springfield, Oregon. Just across uh, from um, from Eugene, and it's a it's it's an interesting market because the U- Eugene's got a team in the the Northwest League, and uh, it's it's not clear how long that's going to last. It got a ballpark issue that they need to solve, as they're probably not going to be able to play much longer in PK Park where the the Ducks play, uh, but. Um, there's a long history of minor league baseball in Eugene going way back. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that area, and it's a big, when you consider Springfield and uh, Eugene, it's a, it's a, it's a good sized market. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens when with, with two teams, the, the Emeralds, Eugene's Northwest league team starts in this week. Actually, okay. uh, the Northwest League used to start in June. Uh, now they start in in April, but come early June, there will be two teams in that market: uh, the West Coast League Springfield Drifters and the Eugene Emeralds. So it's uh, a bit of an experiment. So the league's got sixteen teams in it now: mm-hmm. Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alberta. That's right. Is that, yeah. Okay. I didn't know this was going to be a geography lesson today. Sorry, I'm like, <laughs> I've got a map. Okay, uh, that I can see from here. It's uh, and it's uh, we are uh, certainly one thing that distinguishes our league. We talk about the geography and the scenery all the time because it's 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 unique. There's no other collegiate summer league that's got any can can remotely approach uh, our 
the, the, our footprint. Right. Most of them are fairly self-contained uh, within, you know, if, you know, an easy bus ride away. All the, the teams are all re- very close to each other, or at least reasonably close. But uh, we're more like the old Pioneer League in the minor leagues with, with, with 12, 12 hour bus rides. And now with Edmonton in the league, they're not even bus rides, they're flights. So are the Canadian teams scheduling wise, are the Canadian teams playing amongst themselves more or is it a balanced schedule where there is Edmonton going to be playing, you know, in Springfield? Cause that's a long, that's a long. Yeah. It, 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 yes. It would it, Edmonton, I don't remember if Edmonton's playing in Springfield. I think they're probably not. We do have a regionalized schedule. It's not balanced. Uh, but Edmonton will be making some trips down into, I believe, into Oregon. I know that the Portland Pickles are flying to Edmonton okay. early in the season. So, yes, uh, you know, with with Edmonton, they're so they're, – they're actually – one thing I didn't realize until they actually joined the league is just how far up there Edmonton is. I thought, oh, well, they can't be that far from Kamloops and Kelowna. No, they're a long <laughs> ways. They're as far. Edmonton is as far from Kamloops or K- Kelowna as Kelowna is from Portland or Corvallis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, these are massive distances, and I, I I did have a sense for how large Canada is. I did not realize how far Edmonton was from the rest of our league. So in my conversations with, with other general managers and owners, one of the takeaways that I've, I've had is that they all, there's a spirit of collaboration within the league, that the league is um, very competitive amongst themselves. Don't get me wrong. They, they're, when, they, when they're playing, they want to win. There's, but, but there's this collaboration. This, this will all, the league will benefit together if we all work together synergy that's at least how i've what i've been hearing one of the things is still i mean it's not confusing but one of the things i think maybe to a casual listener who's like i didn't know there was baseball in port angeles let's say or i didn't know there was baseball in in portland is the the relationships the teams have with the with the with their pool of players so do you are you involved in any of that as the commissioner? Do you have any oversight in where teams are bring, building their roster from? No, I have almost no role. My role is limited to, and this comes up maybe two or three or four times a year. That's just how rare, rare it is. Occasionally, a player or a coach will email me and ask about placement in the league. And when that happens, I will forward the email along to all of our teams okay. so that I play basically no, nobody could ever say Rob steered this player toward this particular team. But most of the recruiting happens on a, a team level and it, and it, and it, it is, it is almost entirely accomplished via the relationships that our teams have with, with individual schools um because ultimately and this is something that i had no concept of before i was joined the league ultimately what our teams are doing is not recruiting players so much as recruiting coaches the players don't really know where the best programs are which where which which program which would be the best fit for them ideally their coaches do know uh, their coaches know where their players will fit best. And I think quite often the coach, the college coach says to the player, there's an opportunity for you in Wenatchee, Walla Walla, Victoria, wherever it is. And the player says, hey, sounds great. W- when's my flight? I think that's generally how it works. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, they're not. I mean, they're building a roster. They need a certain number of arms. They need, you know. X number of outfielders, infielders, catchers. Okay, but they're working right. with the with the coaches at these various schools that ha- they have relationships with. So they're calling right. Rob up at Portland Community College and saying, "Hey, Rob, who do we have? You know, what do you have?" And and you're able to say, "Well, this this Scott guy over here needs to learn how to do something, and you guys are good at that. So go have him play there." Right, and and on there's a lot of it, it relies to a huge degree on trust. 
because our 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 teams aren't able to go out and scout mm-hmm. all the players, right? It, it, there are hundreds and hundreds of them that are potential potentially could play in our league, and do. We 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 tend to run through players a, a large number of players over the course of a season just because many players and especially pitchers they're really not available for the entire two and a half months of our season. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they have innings limits. Their their college coaches want them to throw X number of innings, and once they hit that limit, then they're going they're they're leaving. So the rosters are. Um, there's a lot of turnover on our roster. So many hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of players will play in our league over the course of a season. I mean, you're, you figure 30 players on a roster, 16 teams, that's 480 players. Right. But the, that 30 is going to not be the same all season. So uh, I actually would actually be curious to know how many players will wind up getting at least one game in this season. I wouldn't be surprised if it, I don't think it'll be a thousand, but it will be somewhere between, 700 and a thousand so that's a huge number really? of players and obviously wow. our teams aren't capable of scouting all those guys so you rely on the college coaches to tell you not just who they want in our league but you also you rely on them to send you a player who can be successful mm-hmm. in our league right. um and if 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 a college coach uh tells you these four guys uh, would be great for your team and then three of those four guys aren't able to handle the level of competition, you're not going to trust that coach the next year. So there's, there's a, there's a, it's all about the relationships between the team and the college coaches. And I think frankly, the, the teams that are the most successful year in year out in our league are the ones that have the, the most productive relationships with, with different colleges. Okay. So I'm going to start bouncing around some questions for you. And like mm-hmm. the, this first question, I'm going to just tell you, I'm, kind of being facetious here so don't take it as a serious question at all but which team has your favorite mascot <laughs> i am going to say it's probably and i have a, this is a very personal answer I, i'm going to say it's the port angeles lefties mascot which and i don't remember his name he's a marmot and he's my favorite because i actually got to spend an inning inside the costume uh, okay. at the all at the all star game four years ago, which was one of the, I've said this many times, but uh, the 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 best part of my job is getting to do all these things that you never think you're going to get to do if you're a baseball writer. Mm-hmm. You just, it's just not something that you you don't think you're going to have your name on a baseball. And I'm oh wait a second, put that back in the right camera because you you held that off camera for me. No. Sure. Are you kidding me? That's cool. Yeah, it's 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 still a kick, and this is that's this, cool. I, think, I don't think my name was on the baseballs the first year because I signed up too late. I might be wrong about that, but certainly certainly by the second season, my name was on the ball. And I will admit, yes, I purchased a few dozen of these and sent them out to friends and family. Are you uh, using them as business cards? <laughs> that's a great idea no i have actual business cards that are stamp your um, stamp your contact information on the other uh, panel these are his business cards is it an amazing idea and i'm going to see if i can do that when we get the next the next batch uh but um but i've gotten to throw out the first pitch a few times something i never thought i'd get to do have you embarrassed yourself just out oh, of yes, curiosity i did okay. also in port angeles i buried oh. one uh, okay. I've had a couple of good ones, and I had the one bad one. Okay. So, and um, something I've always wanted to do is be a mascot because there's I'm basically uh, too introverted and shy to be anything to to do anything remotely interesting around other people. But when you put the costume on, all that goes away. It's like when you you maybe you've noticed this when you speak in a funny voice a cartoon voice or something all of a sudden you become more creative and sillier right. and well it's the same thing when you put the, the mascots costume i was doing the whole mascot thing uh rubbing the heads of bald guys like they do on tv and and 
playing with little high five and little kids. I mean, it was just a blast. I had so much fun. So that's my favorite mascot is the the Port okay. Angeles marmot. But we have some good ones. The the Walla Walla onion is Sweet really Lou. a ton of fun. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I got a great picture of him with my with my then infant daughter before I was from before I was even commissioner. Um, so he's pro- just costume wise, he's probably my favorite. Okay. All right. Sweet Lou. All right. Next question. Alphabetically, name the teams in the league. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I can do that. <laughs> okay, I can definitely go for it. do that. You must right. have a cheat sheet right there. <laughs> I don't, but I've I've typed them into spreadsheets often enough. Okay, that I should be able to do it. All right, you all right, let's do it. Check me on this. Uh, no, right. I'm not checking. You're you're. This is this is honor system. You got it. All right. I'm, I hope I don't miss anybody. Um, it's possible with the new teams. Bend, Corvallis, Cowlitz. Kamloops, Kelowna, um, Nanaimo, Port Angeles, Portland. I missed Edmonton. You missed Edmonton. You missed, I missed Edmonton. One of the new ones. Uh, what did I just say? Por- Por- uh, Portland. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, <sighs> Ridgefield, Springfield, Walla Walla. Wenatchee, Yakima Valley, Victoria. I missed. Who did I miss? I know I, I missed somebody. You, I think you missed Bellingham. I did miss Bellingham. Yes, before Ben. Bellingham comes first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did I say Corval? I did say Corval. You did was say Corval. Was that all sixteen? Yes, it was. Okay. I, I'm still afraid I missed one, but okay. Yeah. Well, I'm saying you didn't, so we'll both be okay. wrong if you did. Okay. <laughs> 16 teams, eight in each division, Mm -hmm. right? Eight teams making the playoffs this year. Right. What other roles? So did you, so let's, the the eight teams making the playoffs is new this year, correct? Yes. Can you walk us through what that process was like amongst the owners? Was it, you know, was it an easy, I don't, I'm not trying to, I don't mean like this, but was it a simple, like, yes, let's do eight. Or was there, was there a lot of negotiations back and forth? It was not easy. Okay. Um, that is the most interesting, you know, the most fun are things like getting your name on the baseball and <laughs> being a marmot, things like that. Um, it's the most rewarding are things like, arriving at a new system for the playoffs because it requires me to actually do some work and go out and talk to a lot of people and try to understand what everyone's priorities are. It's not that the playoffs are a controversial issue in our league. They weren't ever controversial, but trying to, we don't have, technically we don't have 16 owners because uh, we have three ownership groups that own two different teams. So I, we really have 13, okay. 13 groups or individuals that that you need to you want to be on board when you want to change something like like the schedule or mm-hmm. the playoffs. I guarantee you, you're never going to have. If you took a poll, you'd never get all 13 to agree that yes, this is the best way to do something. And I'll tell you. What what I really wanted to do, and, and I, I rarely get exactly what I want. What I really wanted to do was come up with three or four different ways of doing the playoffs and just from the get-go say, we're going to do this one this year and then this other one the next year and then this other one the year after that and just we'll just see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, most, I think most people have a tough time with that level of uncertainty they want a system that they can at least imagine is the best system and just say okay we'll just do that and not have to think about it anymore i would love to have experimented quite a bit more but so the trick though was to come up with something that made enough sense to enough people and i think we wound up voting for it 13 to 0 so it, it all wound up working out okay in the end but the the real issues were um a lot of things go into the playoff system and what it should be, we 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 for many years had the same. We had four teams make the playoffs, and a, a, a best of three series 
followed by another best of three series for the championship. Very straightforward, quite standard in other baseball leagues. And I think that some of us wanted to do something different just to see, just to see if that something different could work. And I think that there was a sentiment for more teams in the playoffs, especially if every team could get a home playoff game Mm -hmm. and get a chance to, A, get that, maybe generate a little revenue, but also just give their fans a chance to see a playoff game. Right. To get, for every team to have a playoff game, you have to do some different things schedule-wise. Otherwise, and this is the big consideration for us, the thing we run into every year is, and I mentioned this with the rosters, you start losing players, especially late in the season, as pitchers hit their innings limits, as I, I, I don't have really have any, any connection to this world, but my understanding is that there's basically two kinds of uh, college academic schedules. There's the quarter system and the semester system. And one right. of those starts in August, I think. Right. Um, I can't remember which one. I think it's the semesters. <laughs> I think. And what that means is you have players literally who have to leave their, their summer team mm-hmm. in mid-August or early August because school's about to start. Right. Or if it isn't about to start, they want a week off or two weeks <laughs> off before school starts right. just to recharge, right? Right. So we wanted to expand the playoffs, allow more teams in without extending our playoff calendar further into August than it already was. And what we hit upon was something that I think is really exciting. The first two rounds of playoffs are still best of three. Um, and then the championship game, it, championship is just a single game. Oh, okay. Which allowed us to not only keep the calendar basically the same as it's always been, but also to create a single game that we're hoping is a little more exciting than a best of three series, which is exciting as well. But all of a sudden now we've got, okay, we can market this championship game. We we know exactly when it's going to be. We know that this is the one game to watch if you want to see who the West Coast League champion is. And uh, I mean, for me, the new system sort of accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish. More teams in the playoffs. Everybody gets at least one home game. And we get to have this single exciting game to determine the championship. So I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. But it was, it was a process that took literally two years. Oh, wow. Um, okay. From, from, from initial discussion at, a bo- at our winter meetings two-plus two years ago to actually voting for it this, this, this winter. What else about your job? So you mentioned disciplinary actions. Mm-hmm. So you have disciplinary. So you're, you're, the, you're the judge. You got the right. gavel. You yes. sentence. But you, you have rules you have to follow. You don't just get to arbitrarily... Mm, the only rule that I follow is precedent, essentially. And the okay. rules that are in the... We have a rule book that's adopted from the, the NCA's rule book uh, when it comes to discipline. And there's precedent. And okay. then there's everything else, which is basically my judgment and my conversations with, with various parties. How many times a season do you have to get involved? <sighs> Well, I have a minimal level of involvement involvement most of the time because most of the suspensions for players are automatic. If a player okay. is ejected from a game, he's automatically suspended. And unless their their circumstances are extraordinary, the number of games for which he's suspended is prescribed by the rules. It's okay. basically one game for a hitter and either four or five for a pitcher. Okay. There it's quite rare that I will suspend a player for longer than that basic person. It's once in four, once in three seasons. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, didn't suspend someone. The, the circumstances were such that the player said something that the umpire misinterpreted as an, as a, a criticism or a complaint. Mm-hmm. And the, the, umpire supervisor said no he shouldn't be suspended so that okay. one time a player was ejected not suspended and that actually felt good to be able to do what seemed like the right thing but otherwise for the most part with players it's 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 not a difficult thing to do not that i enjoy it but it's as simple as writing a quick email to 
the team, the player's team, this guy can't play tomorrow night. Right. That's yeah. pretty much it. Now, with coaches, it becomes a great deal more complicated. That's where the judgment part comes in. And when you play a 54-game season, being suspended for one game, let alone for three or four or five, it's a pretty good chunk of your season. And mm-hmm. this is life and death for the coaches. At least that's how it feels to them at the time. And so I take each one of those incredibly serious. I mean, I will spend many hours on uh, a decision for for a head coach. And that's just something you, you can't do lightly. Nobody's pleased. Typically, the coach doesn't think he should have been ejected, let alone be suspended. Mm-hmm. Typically, his 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 the team he works for thinks he probably shouldn't have been ejected and definitely shouldn't be suspended. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's 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 by easily the most difficult and least pleasurable part of my job. Okay. Yeah, that wouldn't be fun. I wouldn't like to do that. <laughs> I don't either. I would like to. Do I that. really don't. So have you? There's four new teams this year, so twelve. There's twelve teams in the league as of last season. Have you been to all twelve ballparks? I have been to all twelve. Yes. Okay. In fact, my first season, which was, I always get these mixed up. I guess it was 2019. Uh, no, it would have been 18. Um, my first season, I did get a chance to visit all of our ballparks, which was fairly easy um, because we had only 12. Mm-hmm. And my daughter was still quite young, and it was actually easier to be away from home. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to make it to all 16 this season. Um, what, I'm, what I'm definitely going to do is get to all the new ballparks, mm-hmm. all four of the new ones, and um, – and then probably half of the rest. So yeah. then in the long term, I think my goal will be to, to get to at least half of our stadiums every year. Okay. Does your daughter, does your daughter like baseball? Is she finding it interesting? No, she has zero interest. When we go to a game, she'll just basically run around in circles. At least that was the experience last, last time. Uh, it might be different now that she's seven, almost seven and a half. Um, so no, she doesn't have any interest in in really in sports at all. Okay. All right. So what is the one thing? Well, I I kind of asked this question earlier, but like, what's the one thing about your job that you just completely like didn't think you would enjoy, but you are enjoying? How's that? Let's let's reframe it that way. I think it's something I alluded to earlier, which is the relationship part. Uh, I went through most of my life and certainly my professional life without really talking to people very often. I was one of those writers who was happiest holed up in his little cubby, just typing away. Um, Whether it was blogging or working on a book, uh, most of my books, my first five books or six were almost completely from my head and from things that I was finding during my research. Okay. And it, it wasn't until my seventh book, the, the one that came out the shortly after I, my first season as commissioner, where I actually made a real effort to get out and talk to people. Okay. I probably conducted and not a ton for the sort of book that I did, frankly, a lot of it was out of my head and, and from research, but, but I did, I did conduct probably, 20, 25 interviews for, for that book, which was far, which was more than all the rest of my books put together. Okay. And, um, and I've also realized at some point well into my career that where the work that I found the most rewarding was the work that involved talking to people. And it turned out I wanted to be a reporter the whole time and just didn't know it (laughs) because I was too, uh, I basically too shy to get out and 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 speak to people. I mean, when I was at ESPN for years, I I, I could have basically gotten anyone on the phone because I worked at ESPN, and I did right. not take advantage of that opportunity very often. But when I in some of my later work, when I worked at 
at uh, SB Nation, which is also known as Fox Media, um, and at Fox Sports, I actually decided that I wanted to do some bigger stories that where I had to go out and actually talk to people. And I loved it. I just loved those conversations. So what I have found the most rewarding is in this job is not writing stories about the league, um, although I've done a few of those, um, but just sort of the job is getting on the phone and checking in with people. Mm -hmm. And turns out I really enjoy that. And I think that the, the real pleasure for me in the job is just having to learn all these new things, uh, especially about, you know, writing decisions. Uh, that's, that's been interesting too. writing these disciplinary things up and, and having to sort of think through that process is while not enjoyable, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but having to forge the best relationships I can with, different people in the league and then figuring out ways to get people to work together or encourage them to work together. That's all just, it's all completely new for me. And when you are in your early fifties, which I was when I started this job, you just don't, you just don't think you're going to get a chance to learn something completely new. Um, at least I never thought I would. I didn't and, think so either. <laughs> and here I, and here, I, here I am with this completely different sort of job and I learn something new every day, and I think I get better at it. Doesn't mean I'll ever be a great commissioner, but I think I'm a much better commissioner now than I was when I started, and I should continue to get better because there's always something to learn. All right. So when you're not being commissioner of the West Coast League, what do you like to do for fun? <laughs> what do I do for fun? Uh, I Let's see. I spend a fair amount of time rock climbing. I was just up in your neck of the woods not long ago. I was in an area I'd never visited before called Frenchman Cooley, which is right across the river from Vantage. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've driven through I've Vantage tried. any number of times. Many number of times, yes. Um, on the way back, we took the scenic route from Vantage to Ellensburg along the old the old oh. highway, which was a great okay. deal of fun. I he, love road trips. Um, okay. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time bird watching. That's another one of my numerous hobbies. And I, and I try to read as many books as I can. And so what do you, what are you reading right now? Time. Pardon me? What are you reading right now? Right now, I just finished Bob Odenkirk's new book last night. Okay. Uh, and... I have oh, and I'm and I'm sort of started Bob Dylan's book, which came out like 20 years ago, but but uh, for some reason I've never 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 started reading it. Um, there's always a massive pile of books that I'm behind on, not to mention all the issues of the New Yorker that that make me feel bad. Um, but uh, and I just read a great baseball book about the American League in the 1960s and 70s. Okay, are you a coffee drinker? <laughs> I am. I came okay. to it very late, uh, but I am a coffee drinker. In fact, <laughs> speaking of hobbies, this kind of went, this kind of uh, uh, fell away a little bit when my daughter started going to school every day because I'm not typically, uh, I don't have the free time that I used to have. But I have visited, I think the last count, 167 independent coffee shops in Portland. Okay, so normally on this show, I say Portland's dead to me. That's kind of just the running <laughs> gag. Uh -huh. But you've you've completely, I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So name drop a few. Give me, give, I, I, here, let me tell you what I like in coffee. I am just kind of yep. a plain Americano, black coffee drinker. I'm not mm -hmm. interested in in latte art. I mean, it, you know, it just it's not my thing. So right. where when, next time I get to Portland, where should I go for coffee? Well, I should send you my spreadsheet. Of course, I can't just visit. I've got a spreadsheet with oh rankings in various categories. Oh, my God. So the hundred seven. I'm, I'm serious. Please send it to me. Please. I, it, I will send it to you. It's actually a Google sheet that is available to the public. So I'll just send oh you the my link gosh. to the Google sheet. Um, I, again, I'm a little bit out of practice because it's been so long since I've actually done. I used to basically drive all over the city to visit new ones and I just don't have the time to do that anymore. So it's sort of a treat now when I 
am out and about and I see, oh, there's one. I just went to one that's a couple blocks from my climbing gym that's brand new. It's sports themed. So they okay. have tenants on the wall, um, a lot of basketball related art, um, really fun vibe, a lot of young people hanging out. Um, the na- and the name is escaping me. The one that I have been going to pretty religiously for a number of years because it's it's six blocks from my house is a motorcycle themed coffee shop called Two Stroke. Okay. And I actually wrote a good chunk of not the most recent book because that was COVID times, but the one before that, Powerball, I wrote a big most of that book. I write on I write on uh by hand um I write longhand. Oh you do? Okay. I do. And I wrote most of that on on legal pads at at, at two stroke. Oddly a block away from Two Stroke is another motorcycle-themed coffee shop called CC, and there are actually three CCs in the Portland area, and this is the second. But yes, there are two uh, motorcycle coffee shops within a block of each other here in my neighborhood. So, what is so your I beverage spend, of choice? It's just black coffee. I started out, so I said I came to coffee late. I was going through a a, a personal emotional crisis some years ago. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to try coffee. What the hell? I, 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 the, all the rules are out now. Uh, I need to do something to, sh- to, to get out of this rut. So I tried. Somebody said, well, if you're going to try coffee for the first time. Uh, this was a woman. Actually, she was on our first date, as I recall. We were a, a long walk. And she said, well, if you're going to try coffee, let's just pop in here. And you should try a, I think she said you should try a latte. That's v- incredibly inoffensive. And. Guess yeah. what it is? Yeah, it it's is. It's just basically milk, hot right. milk. Right. Um, so that was, and then I went from there to mochas, and then um, espressos were, were nice too. And then about three years in, I realized that, A, I'm spending way too much money when I go to a coffee shop because I, I can't just have one. I have to have two uh, if I'm going to be here for three hours. <laughs> and uh, it's expensive. And I'm, there's a lot of calories here. So then I, and I had said for years, I said, I'm not, I can't drink just black coffee. It won't taste good. I tried a black coffee. It tasted okay. And now I'm just one of those guys who goes in for the black coffee and then the free refill. That's free where refill. I've been for six or seven years now. Okay. So you're that, you're that, you're, you're that I'm, guy. As am I, as am I, to all fairness. I am you, that, guy. that guy. Yep. Yep. Do you make coffee at home? I do, uh, mostly because my wife insists on coffee in the morning. Okay. But yes. How are, I, how are you making coffee at home? Uh, French press. Okay. All right. Whole beans, grind them, and okay. then French press. All right. Here's, uh, what, what's, what beans do you typically get? That's a good question. I think we are right now signed up for some service where we every month we get this massive bag of bird-friendly coffee from Costa Rica or wherever okay. we make the bird-friendly stuff. Okay. And you were holding up a coffee mug there that no one else but me can see. So what was right? This? Well, there's a certain. This is what a coffee mug should look like. I, I have, you know, sort of the traditional. Yes, the diner style. Right, the diner yes. style coffee mug. It, it if it's not a, di- it doesn't taste the same to me if it's not in the proper, I, I the proper receptacle. I hundred percent agree with you. Hundred percent, absolutely. Because I was going to hold up the, the weight one. and the right thickness of the lip. I mean, you got the whole thing. This one is. Just a Starbucks from Chicago, and it's not thick enough. It it's down here, but it's it's great for tea, but not for coffee. Not for coffee. I agree. Yep. Okay. Oh, your new book. There is a new book. Um, it was <laughs> again. This is one of the things that just sort of. I, I I didn't exactly just fall into it because I actually made some effort. So it's one of those rare, rare times when me actually trying wound up leading to something, um, something wonderful. When I was working on my previous book, Powerball, back in 2017, I think that's when I was working on it. I went to, no, it would have been 2018, the spring of 2018. I wanted to talk to somebody for the book about the lack of any real presence in the game of out gay men mm-hmm. players umpires coaches the whole thing i also want to talk to someone for the book about the current state of the strike zone and i wanted to talk to somebody about 
baseball's efforts to speed up the pace of play. Mm-hmm. And I realized that there was one person who could speak to me about all of those things. His name is Dale Scott, who at that point had just retired after a 30-year career in the major leagues as an umpire. And I don't remember how I connected with Dale, but he was gracious enough to meet with me. We both happened to be down in Arizona during spring training, and he agreed to meet with me. And we just had a great talk um, at a hotel bar for two or three hours. He was very forthcoming and, and personable and could not have been more gracious. And I thought this guy's story would make for a great book. And when you when you work as a writer for as long as I did, you know, ultimately, I think almost every writer thinks they'd like to work on a book with someone else, a, a, some baseball figure. It's just one of the things, you know, it's one of those boxes you check off, right? Yeah, right. You, you want to do a book. And then, oh, yeah, you also want to do a book with this player or this manager, whomever it is. And I'd never, I'd always wanted to try it because I thought it would be an interesting challenge. And I also admired those books when they were done well. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned to Dale at some point, either during that conversation or perhaps I emailed him later. Uh, have you ever thought about doing a book? And he said, he said, no, he said, no, I just, it's not something that ever really appealed to me. So I just sort of put it out of my mind. And then a year or two later, a, a, a friend of mine who's a longtime broadcaster here in the, in the Portland area, Rich Burke, he emailed me and said that he had run into Dale at some event the night before, and Dale had said he was thinking about doing a book. <laughs> and I thought, no, not a, he can't do it. He can't do a book with somebody else. Um, <laughs> well, my, Rich said, you should check in with Dale and see if, if, um, if, if, if he'd like to do work with you. And so I emailed Dale that day, or maybe even texted him. I can't remember. Can't remember. And we met lo- not long after that. And, um, um, the tricky part with the book with Dale was not us agreeing to work together because that happened pretty quickly. It was about finding some place that would publish the book. The, the world of publishing has changed quite a bit in the last, I don't know when it happened, I guess it's been gradual, but it's not nearly as easy to get a book deal these days as it Actually, that's not true. It's it's probably easier to get a book deal. It's quite a bit more difficult to get a book deal with a major publisher mm-hmm. compared to 20 or 30 years ago. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, a Dale Scott book with one of the big publishers, I think there are five now, four or five, somebody might have just merged, maybe it's four, but with the big five would have been easy 15 years mm-hmm. ago. In fact, I've got a over there on a shelf a whole a giant collection of books written by umpires. Um, okay. Some of them umpires that people don't even remember or barely remember. They weren't super famous. Like there was an umpire you might remember back in the late seventies and early eighties named Ron Luciano, who was I remember that like name. a household name. Right. He's on talk shows and they would show video highlights of him all the time. Cause he was kind of did all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, umpires are not household names anymore. And the big publishers don't have any interest in in publishing books by people who aren't household names. Okay. Um, fortunately, there are a number of other publishers that don't pay as much, but they will publish p- books by sports figures. And some of them do a fantastic job on the production side, which is really something that was important to me. And I think to Dale as well. It's one thing to do a book. It's another thing to you, to, to do a book that looks good. Um, looks like a lot of care was taken with the design and the, the, the publishing. And that's what we found ultimately with the University of Nebraska Press, who publish okay. a large number of baseball books, and they do a fantastic job on the editing side and the production side and the design side. So uh, the money was not what it would have been with somebody like Simon & Schuster, but otherwise we just had a fantastic time working on the book. Uh, Dale was great to work with, and I'm honestly really pleased with how it turned out. Okay, and when's that coming out? It's out. Um, It's kind of a funny thing. We, we, (laughs) our publication date was and is May 1st, and we were actually told a few months ago that because of the supply chain issues we've all heard so much about, that we might not, we, we hoped, we hope we can make it, actually make it on May 1. 
Okay. And Amazon was actually shipping books May, I mean, sorry, not May, March 15 or March 12 or something uh-huh. um, is when I received my book, the one I'd ordered from Amazon just to see how long it would take to get one. So okay. yes, the book is out there. I don't know if it's actually on shelves yet, but certainly it can be ordered from all the, the various places. And, um, and Dale's been doing publicity for it, but it, it's great that it, that it came out early. It did kind of completely upend our promotional efforts <laughs> because we had all these things scheduled, right? We're going to do, right. we're going to reach out to these people and these people and do an interview here. And, uh, but w- Dale will be out promoting the book. He's already started and he'll be promoting it through the summer because he's going to be appearing at pride nights at various major league stadiums, okay. uh, June, July, I think even August. All right. This is my last question of you. It's the same question I ask pretty much everybody. What didn't I ask you that I should have? <laughs> it's interesting. I have, I have thought about the answer to that question a few times over the years. Um, and I have actually answered it in my head. Um, but this was a longer interview than basically anything I've ever done before. So you've, you've hit you've actually basically asked me all the questions that that I would have asked myself um especially because this is you know essentially a west coast eccentric um interview most of the questions that I think about asking myself are you know about all my publishing failures uh why this book wasn't very good or why this one actually never got published um so here's 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 one here's one that 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 you could ask me. You could ask me what's the uh, aside from the new book, what's the last thing I wrote that I cared about? How about that? Oh, okay. How about that? What was the last thing you wrote besides the new book that you that you cared about? Well, it's been too long, unfortunately, <laughs> but um I was uh, one of my hobbies um that I didn't mention before is whenever I travel, I tend to send a lot of postcards okay. to people. All right. uh, that's a, something, it's like an, it's, a, it's a, okay, it's an obsession. I should just admit that. And okay. <laughs> I, spend, I spend way too much time on trips writing postcards. Um, and ultimately, because I enjoyed that so much, I wound up deciding that I can't just send out the postcard. I've got to, when I can, affix to that postcard a, an appropriate stamp. So when I sent postcards out from my climbing trip, my recent climbing trip in Washington, uh, they came with, with, with stamps celebrating Washington statehood. That's the sort of nerd slash weirdo that, that, that I can be. Um, so I, 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 anyway, I, I really enjoy the world of stamps. I'm not really a stamp collector. I don't have the books with the hinges and the thing, but I do have, I do have a lot of stamps. They're just okay. sort of like in envelopes ready to be used to someday. Use, right? use them. Okay. Um, one of the things that I particularly appreciate are baseball stamps. Okay. Um, and of course there's a long history of those. In fact, there's just this, this, I think it just opened. There's a, there's a, there's a, the Smithsonian has a stamp museum in Washington, DC, which I visited and loved. It's probably my favorite museum there, except maybe Aaron space. And, They've got a new exhibit on baseball stamps, which I'd love to see. It's going to be there for four oh. years, so I think okay. I, three I, years. I wouldn't have to get out and see it. The Smithsonian's amazing, so that's... Yeah. Okay. So I... When when Henry Aaron died, the natural question people, I think, had is, when is, when is Henry Aaron going to get his own stamp, right? Mm-hmm. And from that, I thought it'd be fun to sort of delve into the process. How does someone get a stamp, Oh, okay. turns out there's a waiting. There's a long waiting period. Typically, hmm. there's a process that's involved. You have to be dead. You probably knew that. A lot of people know that you can't. No living American can be on a stamp, um, right. or any, living anyone. Um, but you, not only do you have to be dead, but then once you're dead, you have to be nominated. Okay. And then there, there's this long process that has to be gone through. You know, first, it has to be approved, and the art has to be. It's a, anyway, um, I was just really curious about that process, and I pitched it to. Uh, this sports editor at the New York Times who I had 
gotten to know a little bit over the years, um, and he was kind enough to allow me to work on that story. So I got to sort of delve into that process. I got to speak to the artist and the oh. designer of the Yogi Bear stamp that came out last year. So oh. it was sort of a Yogi centric, Yogi stamp centric right. piece. Okay. But it was also about how that how that all works. That's and very cool. Why it'll be a while until Henry Owen gets a stamp, and why there won't be an Ernie Banks stamp for a while, and just the whole thing. And they did a really nice job with it in the Times with great art and. Um, there, even now after all the, and I've had stories in the times before, but that really, that's the sort of thing that doesn't really get old, especially if you're, if you don't get to do it very often is to see your, your work in the New York times print edition. That was a lot of fun. So I, that, that's... that was, uh, last spring. It's been almost a year, but, but that's the last thing that I really, really enjoyed. Okay. Enjoyed writing. We've, we are, I've taken a lot of your time. I do have another question. Sorry. Sure. As a kid, just because you kind of you kind of open you, you kind of open the door with the postcards and the in the appropriate stamp thing, so mm-hmm. and, and the spreadsheet of coffee shops, <laughs> baseball cards. Not really. I don't know why. Um, I think I had a limited amount of of uh, disposable income when I was a kid, and honestly, this is actually sort of horrible. My I had two collections of cards when i was a little kid uh the first was accumulated when w- w- when i stole them from a grocery store okay um not proud of that i was i was apprehended <laughs> at some point in that that process and um um and embarrassed and the whole thing like that was when i was about eight and then um so i had i had this actually i had one collection when i was a kid so i had this giant box bit of of baseball cards and then uh, a couple years later i sold them to a neighbor kid for four dollars and 35 cents whatever he had in his pocket and uh <laughs> later that same day he came back to me crying wanting his money back because he'd gotten in trouble for spending 435 on this this box of of, <laughs> of three-year-old baseball cards um i did not give him his money back so that was the end of my collection when I was in college, believe it or not, then I decided it was okay to take all my disposable income, i.e. college loans, mm-hmm. and try to complete sets one pack at a time, which a lot of people can relate to that process. It's a terrible waste of both time and money. But yes, yes that, I, d- I did that. And I have, a, I have a few thousand cards, but it's hardly a, a, a collection. I really appreciate them as little artifacts of their time, but I've never spent a lot of money on it. 1971 tops, the black border cards. Love that set. Fantastic. I was nine. My grandmother would let me walk up to the local corner grocery store and I would buy 10 packs for a buck and try, you know, I had no idea that tops was releasing these in series so that I would <laughs> never get anything. Right. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting the good cards. I would trade them with the neighbor kids as best I could. I, I got <laughs> smart enough to try to go to a different store thinking that they'd have different cards. But uh-huh. I'm still, I, I don't, I have a collection. I don't actively collect. Every now and then I'll go and say, okay, what am I missing in that 71 set? Because I just want to complete that 71 set. I don't care about condition per se. I'm not going to go out and I don't like the graded cards. I don't, I'm not a fan of the entombing them into plastic i want well especially the 71 set which is notorious because the black border obviously gets flaked off and it's almost impossible to find right mint cards so that's that's the one for me of my childhood but the one i stumbled into are you familiar with the t212 obac cards from the 1909 10 and 11 i know i've seen them i can't yeah it's a west coast minor league oh of course oh yeah i that, yeah. That's sort of a holy grail for me because I'm such a big fan of the Pacific Coast League baseball. I have, I think I have all three years complete now. Wow. And that's not impressive. in good condition. I mean, I would take, mm-hmm. you know, I've got some that are, you know, just brutalized. But yeah, that's a, uh, and the, my biggest regret probably is I sold, I had a porcelain, tin tin porcelain covered Obac tobacco sign that I sold mm-hmm. one time and I, I can never find it. I haven't been able to find another one. Anyway, that's that's fine. But anyway, um, well, I thank you so much. This was a lot of fun for me. I'm I'm excited for the West Coast League this year. Actually, one do I'm going to put you on the spot. One last question. I won't ask you about the West Coast League, but I will ask you about Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. Who's going to win the American League Championship, and who's going to win the National League Championship? 
<laughs> now, I think I said like an hour ago that I have not even. I know, looked at it's, but that's you, you can pontificate. So I'm just going to throw out a couple of teams here. Um, okay. I'm going to say that this is finally the Rays year because I say that every year. Okay. And I'm going to pick someone who's not the Dodgers because I'm sick of the Dodgers winning. Okay. Winning every year. And uh, I'll choose my favorite National League team, which I'm just discovering is my favorite at this moment. And that would be the, let's, let me think here. Um, who do I want to win? I always pick the team I want to win. I'm going to yeah. say the Giants. I'm going to say Giants Rays in the World Series. And who's going to win it? I'm going to go with the Giants because I, I'm uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, of Gabe Kapler, who's been on my podcast. Okay, fair enough. So another year that I'm not going to be happy as a Mariners fan. I just kind of come <laughs> to accept that. Uh, look, hey, they, they should be better. Uh, the the yeah, they the should. The thing is, b- before the season, people like me can reasonably say to fans of many teams that you are being irrationally exuberant. But every year, two or three of those teams that aren't supposed to win 90 games, they're supposed to win 80-some games, win 90-some games. Right. That was last year for us. Yeah. So so uh, I I think that there, there are some teams that have no hope. But to me, any team that has re- reasonable hope, and the Mariners certainly do, their fans should be over the moon. Because it could happen every yeah. year, it could happen for for teams like that. So I sure. think we were, I think we were hoping for one more big, big name and f- splash and free agency, and we didn't get right. that. But I think what they picked up, I'm, hey, we'll see. Well, we'll see. starting the season with the number two prospect on the in the lineup, that's exciting too. I mean, there are a lot of reasons. To is like he going to make team. the? Is he going to make the the? The opening day? Oh, they've announced that. Yeah. Oh, they, just I didn't see morning, that. Oh, they, they have. said he's on. He's 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 on the roster. Yep. Oh, okay. All right. That's that's exciting. Okay. So Scott, you've got well, Julio. Yeah. So there we go. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. I really appreciated talking to you. It's it's really been my pleasure. I, I, I just have fun. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.